All right, looks like we're live. Uh, so welcome back to Questing Beast, everybody. Today I have the guest Tim Cask with me. Uh, Tim is a legend in D and D circles. But um, Tim, why don't you introduce yourself to the viewers? Ah, uh, yeah, I'm Tim Cask. The legend stuff is in everybody else's mind. <laughs> uh, I was the first TSR employee, and I started Dragon Magazine, and I. I've worked on all the major gaming magazines that have been in existence. So uh, uh, the distinction is last guy still alive, and I intend to hold on to that as long as possible. Cool. Um, what the one of the reasons that I found out about you? I'm a relatively recent um, person to RPGs. I think I started playing like five years ago. I discovered uh, your YouTube channel, The Curmudgeon in the Cellar, which I love, and I watch all of them. And I'm curious what made you want to start a YouTube channel because you seem to be one of the few people from you know that era of TSR and D&D &D actually get involved in new media and do stuff on YouTube. Cancer made me do it. Mm. Really. Um, I was doing a, uh, a regular blog. I was typing, you know, I was writing a blog, Dragon, Dragon Grumbles, and I'd been doing that for some time. And then um, I had uh, the better part, well, half my colon and a tumor taken out uh, a little over a year ago. And uh, the chemotherapy involves platinum. And when you reach what they call minimal toxicity, you get peripheral nerve damage in your fingers, your hands, and your feet. And so it was painful to type. So I felt I still had things I wanted to talk about and things I wanted to say and questions I had to answer. So um, I did one on Facebook and um, somebody taught me, showed me how to, and I went over to YouTube and I've done um, 20 curmudgeons in order. The one I did before, I did a funny one on soccer, trying to explain soccer to uh, my ignorant friends in this side of the, the, the globe. And uh, um, I don't know. There might be another one over there. It, it's just, for me, it's, my, my problem is sitting down and, not only, and only talking about 30 minutes. Shoot, most nights I could go on for 45 or 50. So I have to limit my topics and then I pay attention to the clock at the bottom of the monitor <laughs> to try not to go. I blew it over 40 a couple of times and a couple of 30s, but I stay right around 20, 32 minutes. And I try to talk about four or five things. And I just, uh, like you, I answer questions. Um, I don't say that mine's better than yours. Um, I just say if you're having fun, you're doing okay. And I'll show you ways that I have fun. And if you think I have more fun than you, well, that's a quantitative judgment. And I can't do anything about that. And if you think you have more fun, well, good. You know, this is all supposed to, you know, gaming's all supposed to be about having fun. Um, I got into it when I was in the sixth grade. I was 11 or 12. And I got Evelyn Hill's D-Day. And another yeah. precocious kid in the sixth grade. And I sat down and over the course of a couple of weekends, we figured it out and played it. And I was hooked. Chess went by the board. Everything else went, I'm into games. And I did it for the problem solving. And it was only later uh, when I was in college that I did it for the social. When I found out there were so many other games, and, or gamers rather, and I got to college and there was 15 other guys that all played games. And that was more guys that, that was more than all the guys I'd known up till that time that played games. And that was, of course, 1973. We're just getting ready to rumble. And um, it's, you know, it took off in late 73, started, it built. And then uh, I went to Gen Con in 74 and uh, played uh, in a couple of d and games. And of course, the rest is history. Um, before I went to Gen Con, I'd been on the phone with Gary many, many, many times. I, we were phone friends, never met each other in person until I did go to Gen Con. And then we met in person for the first time. And then all the rest of that, uh, it's been pretty well covered. But that's how I got into it. I, I stay into it for the social. Yeah. I have a bunch of buddies that I'm some of which I've been playing with since the mid eighties. And we get together every other Wednesday and we play board games together and we call each other names and we stab each other in the back and we do all the things that gamers do, you know, uh, and, and it's fun. Uh, the other night we played escape from cold. It's, and they made me the Germans and it, that's the hardest damn game to win is the Germans, unless you shoot to kill. And I was too good a sport for that. Next time I'll know better. <laughs> but uh, you know, we we play multiplayer games that um, are all about the interactions. Um, 
while we do play uh, 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 Ticket to Ride, you don't make a, you don't cut a lot of deals in Ticket to Ride. But if you play Feudality, you cut a lot of deals. If you, well, if cold it's all the prisoners are cooperating, they, they should be anyway. Um, there's several other games we play that, um, you know, a couple of guys get together and stab somebody else in the back and then they turn on each other. And that's part of what I've always enjoyed about uh, multiplayer games of that nature. Now, obviously, if there's three guys playing the uh, Russians at Bordino and three guys playing the French, well, you're not going to turn on each other. But um, in, in that type in that type of setting, that's why I play problem solving and 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 fun. If you're not having yeah, fun, yeah. you're not doing it right, and find something else to do or find a better addition. What what really is um, stuck out to me? Hold on a second, I'm getting a little bit of echo. Maybe it's from my own. Oh, it might be getting echo from your side. Oh, oh I don't hear it. Okay, that's fine. Um, so. What really stuck out to me was when you said that you play for problem solving, which was really interesting to me because that is something that people in like the OSR circles talk about all the time now. And I feel like it's go getting more and more into the mainstream playing D&D &D for the problem solving aspects um, well, rather, rather than just like for the narrative. So I thought it was really interesting. It, it was originally about the problem solving. It evolved into the narrative, but now it's coming back to its roots. Uh, the problems were, okay, there's all this stuff underground and all these things got stuff that we want. The problem is, how do we get it? Okay, that's the very first problem. All right, how do we get it? And from that, you, you go on to solving. Each room becomes, you know, especially if it's got traps and, you know, crap like that. Each room becomes a puzzle that you have to solve. I was recently asked, what don't modern edition players do enough of? They don't gather enough information. They don't ask enough questions. Now, I'll be the first to admit that in the hectic hogger mugger of a con, if I got a couple of guys at the question at the table just peppering me with questions, I might look like I'm annoyed, but I'm not annoyed with them. I'm annoyed with myself because I can't give them answers fast enough. Hmm. I started playing, my, my mom was a huge game nut. We, we started playing Candyland when we knew the colors. Okay, I mean, that's the way I grew up my family. And I got into chess and checkers and that for the problem solving. I um, got a bunch of books on chess and I'd set up, you know, some dilemma, you know, classic move, whatever, gambit. And then I, I would, you know, try to figure out ways around it. And that's that's what a, that's why it, it appealed to me uh, or that's how it appealed to me. Other, there were other board games that, that had problems, but most of them were just rolling dice and, and making decisions bad decisions, good decisions. Um, and so when um, board games came, well, that was the ultimate decision maker. Uh, and even if it was just you and one other guy across the table, you're both doing your best to beat the other guy. And um, every roll of the dice gave you a new problem to solve. Every result of a die roll gave you a problem to solve and um, uh, an equation to work, you know, rather than use the word problem, which has other connotations. It gave you a new equation to look at and work. And so uh, to me, that was just infinitely attractive. Plus my natural bent was, um, I grew up in a town of 40 some thousand and we had a real respectable library farm by Carnegie way back when. And by the time I was done in the seventh grade, I'd read all the nonfiction of all the wars up to the second world war that my library had every single book. And I'd read everything in the high school library, you know, because I was a, if I got onto a topic, I read everything I could find on it. And so I had the military background when D-Day came around. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. Landing craft on the beaches, you know, Omaha, all that stuff. So it was like, okay, I think we can do this. And we did. And uh, Mike and I figured it out and we played um, several weekends. We go over and we were supposedly working on a science project. Well, we finished that the first week, put it in his closet, turned it in at the end of the month, got an A. In the meantime, we spent the other three weekends learning how to play D-Day. So uh, I, I do it for the problems. I like the problem solving. Um, I like uh, walking up to um, I like to walking up to a board game and just seeing freezing that moment and then going, okay, well, all right, who? For this guy's turn, this is what I might do. If that guy, you know, and I just like I like that. Um, I like uh, looking at tactical situations and solving them. I always have. Um, 
just uh, one of my many quirks, as my wife <laughs> would say. Just yeah, like, and like so especially in, in stuff like D and D, it the the infinite amount of tactical depth that it can get into because you're sort of taking everything into account just makes it so right for problem solving. It's great to see more people getting into that, even though like well, the rules are so light compared to a lot of like the heavier board games. Well, it, it, well, now it, rules light. Now wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> What, what edition are you talking about? Because <laughs> I've seen some that are just downright ponderous with sure. unnecessary rules and baggage. Um, I'm thinking more of like OD and D and things like that, or BX. Yeah, well, yeah, we were. Well, the original thing of OD and D is if you like it, modify it, take it, and steal it, and make it your own. And so um, the only reason, well, there were two primary reasons. One was financial, having to do with the lawsuits with Arneson. And the other was financial, having to do the fact that we made a fortune at every con we went to on convention on uh, tournament entries, dollar two dollars a head. <laughs> hey, back, back in the late seventies, two dollars a pop. Eight hundred people sign up. That's as much merchandise as we sold. Almost, you know, everything that wasn't D and D, we didn't sell that much. So we had to standardize the rules, which went events, which was absolutely against the grain. And I'm sorry, I keep looking away. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to multitask. I keep forgetting where the mic is. <laughs> That's fine. No, the mic's over here. I keep forgetting where the camera is. Um, we we had to do that so that we could find enough refs so we could run these huge, you know, we could run these huge games. When you had 800 people show up, uh, that was like 90 teams of 12. And we were running enormous groups back then, simply to process the numbers. And we were letting groups come on their own and play together. You know, eight guys come up from a game club, want to all be in the same group. That's fine. We'll find four others to go, you know. And and we would do that. Um, it went against everything we liked about d d If you like it, steal it, make it your own, modify it. Uh, the rules are, are never written in stone. The great, 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 great irony from the first supplement, Greyhawk, that I didn't write the forward to, to the last supplement, uh, God's Demigods and Heroes, the last rule supplement, not talking about swords and spells, every one of those forwards said, hey, these are guidelines. Take the ones you like, ignore the ones you don't, and I'll modify the rest. Mm -hmm. And that remained the theme of OD&D. It's my world. It works that way because I say so. And I've occasionally had some resistance at a convention table. You know, what do you mean it didn't do such and such? I said, well, it didn't. Now, if they were old school players, they'd immediately bombard me with questions and figure out why it did what it did, which wasn't expected to do what it, you know, whatever. And um, so I've, I've had a couple of, I had a funny one at GaryCon a few years ago. <laughs> Guy said, he was muttering. Mutter and mutter, and we were sitting at a long table. I was at one end in a big room with a lot of noise. And he was muttering as we were going through, and I could I could see he was running off. And finally, he says, "You can't do that." <laughs> I, up, I said, "Pardon me, <laughs> doesn't work that way." <laughs> and I said, "Excuse me," he says who? And this guy got up and he walked down the table at me. You know, he's yapping at me, yapping at me. And I go, look, if you're unhappy, I, I don't force you. You're, you're, I didn't tie your leg to the chair. I'm sorry if you're not happy. You know, hey, I'll even go talk to the guys afterwards and make sure you get into another game and they don't charge you for it. You know, and finally I had to tell him to just leave. Well, he, and the, the, the consensus at the table right after he left, because I'm still sitting there kind of, I've never had anybody challenge me like that before. Certainly not at Gary Con. You know, where I'm you know, one of those old, venerable, hoary old uh, icons that Gary got. And this guy got out of hearing. Some of the table said, hey, he must have played 3.5. And it <laughs> just cracked up, broke the ice, and back we went to having fun and things working my way because I said they do. Yeah. It's uh, interesting to see, like, people trying to get back into that mode of thinking, you know, coming out of, you know, 3.5 and 4. Um, you still see this a little bit in fifth edition, but I think less of it where people like they they go on Twitter and they'll ask like Mike Merles or someone like that and they'll ask for permission to change things about D&D. &D. 
I'm like, is it okay? <laughs> is, is it okay if I make my elves like this? Or what if I made a monster like that? Is that too strong? And it's like, that's a strange mindset to someone you know who like plays a lot of old school games. It's but, your game. Yeah, I know. Do you whatever know? you want. It's your yeah. game. Yeah. Uh, on the world that I write my adventures that I wrote for Eldritch on. Um, I have a whole backstory of what happened to the play. Yeah, yeah, da, 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 da. Once I was going to write a book about it. and But I did write all the backstory. <clears throat> and there are areas of low mana and high mana. The ley lines, if you will, whatever your, your you know, understanding of magic and how it works, they've been disrupted. So just take a, 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 a standard ordinary fireball. And in a low mana, it might barely light a wastebasket on fire. In a high mana, it might go off like a flashbang and and, <laughs> and toast everybody's face, you know. Um, and the, and they had to learn that, and they did. And what? And finally, you know. And I ran this thing again and again and again, and it was never the same people. But every once in a while, somebody come up with the idea to throw a continual light on an old crystal and stick it on top of the rock and put a bag over it, and when they get to a new place, they take it off. It's glowing brightly. Uh oh, high magic. Hardly see it at all. Low magic. Yeah. I never put anything in. I never give them a challenge that doesn't have a workaround. I've never created a monster that didn't have literally an Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. Even a boulet is vulnerable underneath that sail on the back. Oh, that's the only word <laughs> it's vulnerable. And it's not as, I don't think I've ever made anything nastier than a boulet. But, um, you yeah. know, it's problems. How do we get around it? Um, a new group, I don't care if you're old school, fifth edition, new group of guys, players. I, I use guys because I was raised in that period of time when male pronouns covered everybody. So I, I constantly get beat up for this. Um, new group, starting a new campaign. Livestock's missing over in this part of the Shire. Um so we talk of some break-ins and, and a murder over in this part of the Shire. And somebody reports that a green wyvern is building a nest over in the peaks. You don't run off and fight the green wyvern. You're a bunch of pukes. You go find out what's going on with the livestock. Goblins steal them. Ah, go beat them up. Get some experience points. Ah, what's going on over here? Oh, bugbear raiders. Ah, track them down, beat them up, get their loot, go up. Now go after the wyvern. Today's mindset, they go, oh, wyvern, off they go. And they expect you to tell them without ever asking a question, everything they found, everything they saw, everything they detected, and whether or not they successfully disarmed it before they even asked, hey, is there any shit in this room? <laughs> well, yeah. This I mean, come, is what come, I come. found in the campaign that I ran a couple of years ago here locally. You know, because I had a mixture of different guys, and, and they were all male. And we played at a friendly local, and uh, they were different ages. I was by far the oldest. But uh, um, these guys, just they, they I think they just expected their skills, skills and abilities to tingle and <laughs> tell them something. That's the biggest mistake I see in the newer edition players. I don't think that's quite as prevalent in five, but I certainly... Uh, I, I don't, I'm not into skills and abilities. I don't like them at all. We develop skills and abilities by doing stuff, being successful, writing that on our character sheets, taking a note of that in our, in our ca campaign notes. And so-and-so became the go-to guy for doing this and this is, you know, this thing or that thing. And they got pluses because they'd already done it well before. You know, and then, so they didn't have an ability you know, oh, my hat's falling apart. Uh, they didn't have an ability to do that. They figured out they were good at it. You know, so you would actually have like organic character growth, where like what they were good at was just based on what they'd done. You didn't come in with a bunch of, a bunch of uh, <laughs> the way they, the way those later editions. I thought you created a character with a big Boy Scout sash full of merit badges already on it before you even took your sword out of your sheath. And went out to fight the rabid dogs in the neighborhood, let alone anything more glorious than that. You already had that huge thing on your chest with all those pretty badges, all your skills and abilities. Yeah, well, I'm red in this one. Oh, you're only green. 
<laughs> you know, it's kind of like going to scout jamborees, everybody looking at each other's shirts and sashes. Um, I don't like that. That was not, that was very against the old school. Um, I play a whole different thing now at conventions. It's very old school. I tell everybody it's going to work that way because I said so. So sit down, grow up, and let's go. And I give them pre-gens or what I call my mid-level pukes, fifth-level guys that have no great abilities, no great liabilities. And, uh, you know, like accomplished mercs looking to make that name rank, next, next rank or next level up. And um, they're in a big wheel. It's a giant wheel. They don't really perceive that until they've been in it a while, and then sometimes they don't. At the beginning, everybody gives me a note card with, uh, I give them all an index card, and they put two nouns on there, mm -hmm. two things. And at least one thing off every card gets worked in the adventure before it's over. And it's a real railroad. You got to go to the next one. You got to go to the next <laughs> one. Everybody needs a key to get out, you know, and the key's up ahead. But I screw with them. I, I messed around with them. I, 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 I fool with perspective. I do all kinds of things that that really, really uh, seems to puzzle some of the later, the later edition guys because I just think it's not necessarily their fault. They weren't encouraged to ask questions, and if you don't ask questions, you don't learn. Mm -hmm. You know. In fact, I was just thinking about this tonight. I'm an ex-teacher. My father always said, you know, if if you don't ask questions, uh, you'll never learn anything. My mother said it never hurts to ask questions, and so I've been asking questions all my life, and. Um, the, the, the people that just sit there at the table for four hours with me at the con never once asked me a question. So that's not the way I DM anymore. I do a much more direct style. Um, I, I walk, go around the table. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? That's also how I do adventures that I make up on the spot. Yeah, the I, I've, I've started doing that as well. I, I'm a teacher too, and I mostly do after school clubs for D and D and things like that. Mostly work with like fifth and fourth graders. Well, and, I um, yeah. at a con with no adventure, I'd run four or three, and everybody that was signed up for the last one had already played in one of them, so I was screwed. So I made one up on the spot. Mm -hmm. It worked so well that I've been doing it ever since, and. When, I, when they got done playing for four hours, and boy, we had fun, and they found the stuff, and they got it back, and they didn't get their legs blown off, and everything worked out great. When I flipped over the screen and they saw nothing behind it, it was like, woo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so I've been doing that since. It's a real simple scenario. Mm -hmm. um, you were hired to guard this thing that was seemingly impregnable. Eventually, they figure out that they tunneled up underneath it, or I'll change it before I run it again. So anybody watching this, you, you no, no spoilers. But they, and then they got to go find them in 36 hours, or those lovely shiny gold coins they were prepaid in that they now can't take out of their pockets, purses, their belts will blow up. So <laughs> let's go. And it's fun, and it's a convention, and we have a good time. <clears throat> you can't really get into the subtleties in a convention. It's all about yeah. the action. It's all about dice rolling. But in a campaign, yeah. it should be about the subtleties. It should be about the story. Now, some of the games that I run at cons, the players are writing the story and they don't know it. Particularly this wheel game that I do now, th what they give me ends up being the bones of the story. So I have no idea when I sit down what the story is going to contain. And so they just gave me the, the all the ingredients, and now it's up to me to put them in an outline and then for them to write in the words and the sentences and make them into paragraphs. That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. Now, here, I give you these these words and these phrases, and now let's, let's see what we can weave out of this. Um, Jim Ward's the best storyteller I've ever heard. Better than Gary was, uh, better than any other I've heard. He has a. What did Jim Ward do again? Did he? What did he write? Alpha. That's right. Yeah. He worked at TSR for a gazillion years. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, he's done a lot besides that. And he's done a lot of work for other people too. And I was partners with him for a while. Um, but he has a he has a very soft demeanor. He used to be an, a girl's English teacher. And he has this very soft, very demeanor, very, very uh, friendly, ingratiating. And as he says, oh, well, it gives me, does not give me any pleasure whatsoever to tell you that that was your last four hit points and you're now dead. <laughs> and he says it just like that, nice, not making fun of you, but certainly enjoying himself. He's unique. 
there's there's several others that are very very good mike curtis is very good jim wampler is very good uh bill webb um uh, uh matt finch they're all good storytellers they're bold finch and webb they're up on the standing on the chairs they have 20 people in the room playing in the game there they are definitely theater of the now mm -hmm. mike curtis is more of a tale spinner uh jim wampler is more of a frenetic director of mardi gras you know and the way he does it but he always keeps it under control and you know uh we all have our different styles uh, I look to tw I twist it and turn it around on people and go for laughs, and uh, but still, you know, I smile while I kill them. Right, right. That, that's you know, that's something that I had, to, I had to train my kids into doing. Like when I started started doing old school um, D and D with them, they were really they were scared, scared of dying. dying. And then eventually yeah. they weren't. You know, they just got used to it. Hey, I'm dead. Make a new character. There's a there's a reason I think for that that it's more prevalent now, way more prevalent than it was in the beginning. In the beginning, we never had just one character going. We always had a stable of characters because of healing rules, because of level up rules, because of geography, <laughs> you know. And so if, um, you know, and we have multiple DMs around TSR. And, and um, so um, Gary would be running a, an adventure in Greyhawk. Uh, and so my so-and-so character would be involved in that and they're overnighting now you know they've forded up in room and during the week rob comes by and says oh i'm gonna run something yeah and, okay who do i and so i go i'll go through my stable and see okay in that time period who's healthy and so i never grew too attached i never i never poured my soul my ka as the egyptians would say never got poured into any of those vessels Oh shoot, man! That's a bummer. He died. That's all right. I got four other guys over here, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll, I'll just you know go have fun with them. And um, this one player, one life, play it for seven months, and then he dies. Um, it's like the kids' soccer team that doesn't doesn't lose all during the regular season. All right, I was a soccer coach for little kids, and I had a team once that went the better part of two seasons without losing. And then they got to the finals in the second season. And it was a fluke, and it was raining, and blah, 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 blah. And anyway, we lost one to nothing. And those boys were devastated. They'd forgotten what it was like to lose. And I'd been trying to reinduce them to that the whole second half of the season, switching positions, you know, not trying to throw a game. But it would have been okay if we lost, just to get that life experience. Well, they didn't. I think playing more than one character when you're, you know, having more than one character going prevents you from pouring all your, your angst, and all your your hopes and your dreams and everything into one character. I think that's. I don't think that's healthy. Yeah, and people get really, really attached. And, and I feel like having a bunch of characters really. What is it? It makes you get more invested in the story of the world and like the group as a whole, rather than just like my path towards godhood. Right. Well, it's like having a stable of players. Yeah. Okay. And um, it's. There's another TSR, well, it wasn't first the TSR game. There's another game that has very much that same mindset, and that's uh, Mike Carr's Fight in the Skies. That was called Down Patrol, and I think it's Fight in the Skies again. We always had multiple pilots because we played all across the span of the First World War, and obviously a guy that was playing, playing, flying blah, 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 Fokker pushers in 1914 wasn't flying, you know, wasn't flying uh, triplanes in 17. So we had a pilot for that period of time. We had we had pilots that had experience on one planes. And if we flew a new plane, we flew with handicaps. Okay, until we had a few missions in that plane. Fight in the Skies is the most role-playing of any non-role-playing game I have ever been involved in. Because you do inhabit a stable of characters, of pilots. And if you play it regularly, Okay, you randomly determine when it is. That determines what pilot, and the, that pilot determines what plane you can fly. So it's all taken out of your hands. It's random. But it's all taken out of your hands, and you you play that pilot. Um, and I remember when Lieutenant Lieutenant Moose Hockey didn't come back from a mission one time, and even I I wasn't flying him. I didn't get over there for three weeks because <laughs> he, he had my favorite German pilot and he had four kills. He almost made ace. <laughs> so that was role play of a different sort. Mm -hmm. um, 
but um the way what we know is role playing fantasy role playing zombies vampires you know whatever rolling dice and assuming a persona and acting it out at the table um not a lot different we're just a lot deeper now yeah oh i have a question from one of our viewers all right um, so the osr is going way more mainstream now it's winning any awards and people are talking about it everywhere so uh zach sabbath <laughs> asks <laughs> zach sabbath asks uh, is, <laughs> right uh, people are actually realizing that it's not just you know you're playing these games because you're nostalgic for the past people are realizing yeah. you, you play them because they're good they're, they're actually fun. fun yeah well the main, the main thing about the old school rpgs is they were quick mm -hmm. you didn't get bogged down in a, a, a 90 minute combat se sequence didn't happen okay it just did not happen whereas some of the later editions it almost looked like a video game on a tabletop and you you were you know, just keeping records ad infinitum, and um, we were fast. Roll some dice. Hey, let's go. All right, now make a decision. Let's go. It failed. Okay, ha ha. We all have a laugh. Hey, it worked. Yay! We all cheer. Let's go. Keep going. I think they stop too much and overthink it and get bogged down. And um, I, I, maybe they've seen too many movies. I don't know, but uh, they ought to be thinking more what it's like to sneak into that nasty farmer's farm. They knew about the grew those sweet melons that had the shotgun full of uh, rock salt. You know, Ch approach everything in the dungeon like that. Like you don't want a butt full of rock salt. Your characters will live longer. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's common sense applied to a fantasy game. Um, Gary and I used to laugh about that all the time about how we're here. We are playing logic to fantasy. <laughs> we, we never could come up with a completely illogical way of a set of rules that would make sense. So. We had to stick to logic, but we tried. Is there, Good Lord. Is there anything that's like been coming out, out of the? Hmm? Is, there, is there anything that's been coming out of the um, OSR community recently that you really like? Any new stuff? Uh, I consider Dungeon Crawl Classics to be very old school in mm -hmm. its approach to the game. Don't get wrapped up in the character. The funnel crawl is the ultimate. Don't grow attached to that character. I I love that game, and Jim Wampler has a companion that the, it's I don't know I don't the books got held up in China and the, all the PDFs are out in that. It's a mutant crawl classic that again oh, yeah. is very old school. Lucy yeah. Goosey, roll some dice, check on the chart. Oh my God, you got the head of a chicken. Let's go, and off you go. Um, it shouldn't take its anything that doesn't take itself real seriously. I see as having been positively uh, affected by the old school. We just didn't take ourselves that seriously. Yeah, it felt bad when, oh, hell, he's dead? Yeah, but hey, he went out and had a beer or <laughs> blew a bong, you know, or whatever. <laughs> he got over it. Yeah, the next day, he had to go back to work, go to school, you know, whatever. You got over it. You didn't go in the morning. You didn't start and, quibbling with the art rules. What do you mean I can't do this? What do you mean I can't do that? Well, you're dragon poop. You know, it just ends it, uh, just ends it argument right there. And Dungeon Crawl Classics, like, dragon poop. that game takes so much out of your hands, which makes it so interesting. Like, even when you're casting spells, like, you're not sure how the spell is going to go off. There's nope. so much dice rolling that, like, you have to kind of surrender control of it to a certain extent. Well, it is, it, 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 you do willingly surrender to chance. Yeah. You inflect, you affect it as much as you're able with your pluses with your intuition with um hey how about if i try this and the dm gives you yeah i'll give you another extra five percent on that one okay good idea all right you try to influence chance as much as you can but there's going to be so many ones come up mm -hmm. and there's going to be so many 20s come up and i don't care if you roll the dice a hundred times or ten thousand times the more you roll it the more uh, more my theory will be proven out and so roll the dice, you know, maybe, maybe that night you're going to roll the dice 40 times mm -hmm. and only five of them are going to be really important. And none of them come up ones. That was a great night. Yeah. Next night, same 20, you know, 20 die rolls. You didn't make one of them. Horrible night. No averages catching up with each other. Whether you play at a nine-hour session or two four-hour sessions, if you chart all the dice rolls, 
they will average out unless you have crooked dice. Okay, yeah. now, <laughs> back, back in the day of those horrible 20-siders from Hong Kong, uh, those dice were not true at all, and there were some that rolled high all the time. There were some that rolled low all the time. Gary had one of each until we caught on, and then was, no, 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 Gary, you can't use the pink die on this one. Roll the yellow one. <laughs> and we all had dice like that, and it wasn't really cheating. It was just fun, you know? We, we weren't there to, it's not like we were taking each other's money home. It wasn't a poker game. Yeah. It's, it's such money, a that's serious. Even with friends, that's that's a different level of serious. Bragging rights a board game? Okay, they all got out of cold. It's, I'm a lousy Nazi. All right, I'll live with it till the next time we play. Somebody else has to be the Nazi, and we'll make fools of him. What's so interesting is like the super relaxed attitude that you can take towards the games, where you can literally just roll some dice and you know not have it ruin your night. Um, and it's interesting to see like especially now the different groups coming up, how some of them take it way more seriously than others. Like, like all the celebrity streamers that you see now, like live play D and D is huge. Now there's like billboards up in LA promoting live streams of D and D um, like critical role has a billboard up um, and they take the game super seriously. They're always in character. And then there's such a contrast to a lot of games like in the old school where it tends to be way more casual. Do you, do you have any opinions about like all these celebrity streamers and like the sort of rise of that thing as a way of promoting D&D? Well, that, that coincides with another thing I've been seeing in social media about paid DMs. You know, what do people think about paying DMs? How much would you pay an hour to play a game uh, that was run by a professional DM or somebody that called them a, <laughs> themselves a professional DM? Now, this is an idea I've had for a couple of years uh, that you know, people want to pony up some money. I'll write them a custom adventure. They can fly me to their town, put me up overnight in a nice hotel, feed me some good food, and I'll run them an eight, 10-hour adventure solely catered to their guys. Now, that's not what this is going on. This is go to a friendly local game store. You want in the game that night, you pay $2 an hour you know, or whatever. Hey, the guy's good. He'll make the money, and if he sucks, he won't. And if you can make a living doing that, fine. I'm a paid gamer in that I get comped at the conventions I go to. A couple of them buy me airplane tickets to get there. Mm -hmm. So I'm a paid gamer. I'm a paid DM by strict definition. Um, so who am I to criticize? Um, the super secret, super serious. I think anything in excess is a bad idea. I think a little of that's excessive. I I really don't like criticizing the way other people play their games. Sure. I really don't. I, I'm I'm often willing to go, well, if it was me, I'd do it this way. Or now that you ask me, I think that. Okay, but I don't like to just come out and criticize them because people ask me all the time, how do I know if I'm doing it right? Do your players come back every week? You're doing it right. You know, are you having laughs around the table during the course of the night besides, you know, Cheeto fingers? You're doing it right. All right. You're doing it right if you're having fun. There is no right way to game. There is no wrong way to game except badly. All right. There's so many ways to game badly. Uh, be a rules lawyer. That'll get you bounced off my table quicker than anything. In fact, bring your rules book to my table. <laughs> Paper, pencil. Dice, ink if you choose. That's what comes to my table. No. It's interesting. Like, what there's a contra well, qu controversy, so to speak, where people have been saying, Well, you have all these super high end, highly produced um, D, D games with professional voice actors. So, everyone is just great voices, they're all in character. And, um, but maybe that creates like uh, false expectations on the part of new players where they think all games are going to be like that. I don't really see that being the case because like these streams are doing amazing work, bringing tons of people into the hobby. You'll have to send me a few of these links. I'm totally unaware of them. Really? Yeah. So there's like critical role is a big one. They have millions of people watch it live. Role. Yeah. I, I, did, I, I, have, I have very little idea of what they do. Um, can you it's, just, a, it's a stable of voice actors. They're all like professional that? voice actors. Can you read that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I'm a very, very lucky man. I survived cancer last year. Congratulations. I get, I get my expenses paid to go to four game conventions each year. Uh, two I drive to, two I fly to. Each year I get to meet old friends at these conventions at four places around the country, meet new friends, play games with strangers. Um, I'm really not that plugged into what all is going on, particularly in role playing. Because here's the big, deep, dark, ugly secret about Tim Cask, Dragon Magazine, and D&D &D editor. I'm not an RPGer first. If you ask me to write my gaming... I'm a board gamer, I'm a miniaturist, and then I'm an RPGer. Hmm. Little known, well, not, not so secret anymore since I've been telling people about it. Dave Trampier, one of the iconic artists of the early school of D&D &D at TSR, Tramp as he's known, and I just about every weekend that he worked at TSR were in my basement playing tanks on my sand table. Okay, <laughs> or we were playing over my study. We were playing samurai or some other board game. Okay, I'm not a role player by nature. I play in celebrity games with a mask to at a con. I love role running games. I was never able to play games in the beginning. I had to be the DM, mm -hmm. and because I was the guy that went to Gen Con, and then of course I was the guy that was going to start play testing for Gary. So I never sat on the other side of the screen to speak of, unless it was with Gary or after I went to TSR, then I got a few times on the other side of the screen. So I don't have a lot of, ex I don't have a lot of experience as a player. Um, I'd like to think I don't need it, <laughs> consider <laughs> considering what I've written over the years and et cetera. Um, but no, I don't have a lot of playing experience, so I don't have a lot of interest in following a lot of this stuff, um, I'm definitely interested when I see a new multiplayer board game come out because we're sick. There's five of us, so we're always looking for a five or six player board game, and so that's what I look for. And then when I go to cons, I get into miniatures games if I can because I donated my last 4,400 tanks to a museum in Southern California. So uh, you know, I I don't have miniatures except my shadow boxes. So, uh, but what I what do I r most rather play? Board games. That's interesting. That's how I got into the hobby too. Growing up, me and my family played board games constantly, and then I slowly kind of moved into RPGs. But I still have a huge collection in here that I play whenever, you know, any chance I get. Yeah. Well, and we we are always looking for a good multiplayer game because there's five mm -hmm. of us. Used to be six. That was even harder. But uh, now with five, we found a few more games we can play. Um, I have a question from um, a viewer regarding Dave Trampier. Just why mm -hmm. did he stop producing? What happened to him? If you know the backstory. As I know it. One day somebody came in and told Dave or he came, be, became aware of and went and asked somebody, is it a fact that I don't own my art? Mm. And I said, no, of course not. He said, bullshit. Now, in, in uh, As a corollary to that story, anybody that has the uh, CD collection of all the old Dragon, the first 250 Dragon magazines, there are pages missing out of there. If you'll notice, many of the issues have had the page numbers scrubbed. Huh. So you can't see that. Some of them was art that somebody said, oh, no, 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 you can't use that. A couple of them were ads for direct competitors that they weren't willing to give them a, a free ad in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And um, it stemmed, part of that stemmed from the fact that I never bought anything but first rights with an option if we did a best of. That was standard publishing procedure in the late 70s. First rights. In some cases, when I was publishing something by Fritz Lieber, or uh, um, Gardner Fox or something like that. I wasn't getting first rights. I was getting single publishing rights. I only had the rights to do that that time only and no other times. Well, Dave was under the impression that all his art was protected thusly. And Brian Bloom decided it wasn't. And his little brother, Kevin, chirped in alongside him. And I believe that is what led to his rather sudden departure 
uh, was over the rights to who bought, who owned his work. And like any, like many a good artist, he felt that he, his work was his work unless you were going to pay him all the rights for it. Because mm -hmm. I basically paid a publishing fee. I didn't, I didn't, you know, if I paid him a hundred dollars to do a, a wormy, well, at the, at the time, uh, the original should be at least worth three fifty or four hundred. You know, but he only was paid a hundred. So that's a, that's a big part of it. Um, he was also having there were there were other issues, uh, personal issues and uh, romance issues and um, a bunch of stuff there. But I think he was deeply hurt to find out that they were going to screw him like that. Um, he felt such about his art that of all the art he ever did for me, he would be Monday morning when the printer came back with all the originals from doing the separation scenario. Then Dave would be in my office, collect his art, take it back into his office, and file it away. But he was always there. He was very pretty. You know, my babies are coming back. I'm going to pick them up at the airport. That kind of thing. I'm the only person I know that he gave two originals to. I'm driving one of them now. I converted <laughs> one of them into a Honda Element. Sold it for five figures. And the first one was not a one. And I have another one. That, and that was a double. That was the, column, the cover that we did that went wrapped around the back for the... Uh, the uh, uh, Kuklathan story, the Irish issue that had the, the chariot. And then I have the uh, Christmas card with all of us in the sleigh wishing everybody a Merry Christmas. And it's caricatures of all the original TSR guys. That one's probably worth more than the other double one in this video. <laughs> but he handed both of those to me in the day he did the day he it separately. And in the day he did it, the second time was I was just as gobsmacked as the first that he did wow. that. That's he just did not give away his art. Mm -hmm. He just didn't, and at least not at that point in his life. And the fact that I had two of them, uh, and that that that, and I I asked a few judicious questions, and yeah, it had to do with rights and being told he didn't own Wormy. And you know, Wormy was his life love. You know, I mean, he put a lot of work into that comic, a lot of work. Yeah. And, um, now that's why he came to came to me was to do wormy. And then TSR hired him away and then they fucked him. Oop, excuse me, I'll have to bleep that one. That's all right. I did so good. <laughs> I did so good right up to this point. Because <laughs> I have a salty tongue, yes. Um one other guy wants to know what your perspective is on high level games, especially since old school D D really has a reputation for focusing on the low level gritty stuff. Um there's just less of an emphasis on the really high level stuff. So what would make that good? What would well, it good? The reason there was a less level emphasis is because you didn't get there. Right. Yeah. In, in yeah. our style of play, if you made 12th level, you retired. You went out and you built a keep and you hired some hired some dudes and you brought some serfs and you laid out some farms. And uh you then became a player in the Greyhawk campaign. And your guy had 20 or 30 or 40 figures that represented his hired men. And so there was a natural progression of retirement and starting over again. And that's why we always had four or five guys going. So we always had somebody that we could, was ready to work up to, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth level, whatever. You know, we were always working on somebody um, to get up there. So um, we, we published... Um, God's demigods and heroes, because we thought that the players at the time needed a sense of perspective. I had been get, I had read, I I had letter reading. We we rotated on who got to read the weird letters that came in, and I was on letter reading duty one day, and I got this letter in from this guy that was bemoaning the fact that he had no idea what he was going to do for his group next weekend. Because this past weekend, they had trashed Valhalla, destroyed the Bifrost Bridge, killed all the Valar, and killed Odin and Thor. And, I mean, when I got up off the floor from laughing, I went in and I read it to Brian. When he got up off the floor from laughing, we went in and read it to Gary. And Gary said, that's it. we got to do something. So that's when we said, all right, time to reality check. If Odin's 300 points, how many did you say you were again? 
<laughs> and okay, you're going to kill 300 points. Uh, I don't think so. Not that way. Not that easily. Mm -hmm. you know? And we tried to we tried to scale back to reality because again, a ninth or tenth level character was so badass, coming close to retirement, had some stuff, acquired some loot along the way, some good magic, wearing good armor, carrying a good weapon. Okay, they were bad. There's no, I mean, they they were they were tanks on the battlefield. If you're watching Vikings, right, the History Channel's Vikings, yeah, the, yeah. Bishop, the bishop that's played by Reese Morgan or Reese Davies, whatever that guy is, he's a berserker on that battlefield in a really good state set of uh, scale mail. That's what you were at ninth level. You just killed everything around you. Okay, that was ninth level. You were that bishop. Okay, you were that bad, you know. Tenth, eleventh level, you were Uhtred on Last Kingdom, right? You were you were a war leader because that's the way it came from. It sprang out of miniatures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we didn't care about getting to fifteenth level. We'd already retired that dude. We're, the fun was in the struggle, bringing another one up. The fun was in the struggle, not seeing how many dragon scalps we could hang on our belt. What's the point? Yeah, kill a it's couple really, of dragons. You gonna really, kill a couple more? It's Who's really interesting to, to, really like, to note that like that stuff is starting to come back again. To come back again. In that, um, in that, um, Matt Colville, who's another YouTuber, has started a, a Kickstarter that's just focusing on strongholds, like building your own castle, starting your own company of followers and stuff. Really old school stuff, but he's designing it for fifth edition. So he's kickstarting this this new book project, and it's raised almost a million dollars in about four days. Is absolutely bonkers. So that sort of thing is That's coming back great. again. People are getting invested in the actual setting rather than just their character. There's a there's a project out there in Lim Kickstarter limbo right now that I think is probably the best gaming supplement for a fantasy RPGs ever produced, and that's the fan the city state of the Invincible Overlord. Oh yeah, by Judges Guild. It successfully kickstarted, and now the third generation of the family has seemingly frozen. Nothing's being done, no updates, no nothing, no idea where all that money went to. I actually reached out to a couple of third parties at one point with a couple of other people uh, who, for lack of a better term, are also names saying look we would we would lend our expertise for nothing just to see this product come back out see what i'm doing mm. nothing um that was a great playing aid that would be shit. that shoot that was two years of playing right there i mean if you play once a week that was a hundred episodes that was a hundred sets ever easy i mean you yeah. could spend a year just playing in the city city adventures Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but uh, we need more of that kind of stuff. I'm surprised that this guy a million dollars to write a strong to how to do a stronghold. Shoot, the, I should have thought of that a few years ago. I know. Well, he has I a big following some of the on stronghold YouTube. rules. <laughs> <laughs> people, people are, people, are hung, people are hungry for it. They want you know they don't want it to just be about their character. They want a way to invest in the world. And there just was nothing for fifth edition. Nothing like that. So then that's a whole niche waiting for people to go in and feed on. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fine. Mm, if they were truly old school, they'd be doing their own. True. All right. The very first time I ever used anything I didn't do was a little piece out of the city state of the invincible overlord. One of their little mini sub adventures. I actually plugged into mine. Oddly enough, I became the person that vetted all their stuff at DSR for a couple of years. <laughs> so I was already familiar with their stuff when I got there. And um, old school, you'd have just you'd have saw them and go, oh, shoot, I can do better than that. <laughs> you'd have gone off and tried to do it. <laughs> now, I'm not saying you succeeded. I'm not saying I would have succeeded. That city state was a massive project. But I do have a city that large that I put together myself years ago. I just haven't finished fleshing it out. I did. I built the program with a PC game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I used a map editor out of a PC game to build my city 
and uh it's quite impressive visually i just got to figure out how to get those damn lines out of the squares <laughs> <laughs> well i had to make 46 maps to to fit it i had to have 46 uh 46 of the map frames to make my city it's big that sounds really awesome i've been trying to make a giant city for a while but those are big projects oh yeah spend a while making them yeah well see i've used them in that i have it printed out and that's the one i make up so i know that over here's the gnomes and i know over here's the dwarves yeah i know this in my head mm -hmm. so i could tell them going you know they got to go east they got to go north you know whatever so um i've got it all made out in my head i just don't have several days to sit down and, and uh, write it all up or dictate it dragon speaking naturally mm. yeah everybody wants to drink, dictate a 40,000 word telegram <laughs> well we're coming up on an hour so oh, okay we should probably wrap it up but turn you into a pumpkin turn you into a pumpkin <laughs> I, I have kids I need to probably oh, say oh, goodnight to them nice. at some point hey, dude, I'm not impressed I have great grandkids oh man okay I'm not I'm not there yet <laughs> Then they're done that twice. <laughs> but congratulations anyway. You obviously care for them. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, everyone, like the big takeaway, what Tim said, make it yourself. Have some ambition. Um, don't ask permission. It's your game. Do it yourself, man. Yeah. yeah. You don't even have to make it from whole cloth. See an idea? Shave half of it off and put it back yourself. Have there fun. you go. Have fun. If you aren't having fun, you're not doing it right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Tim, for coming on. It's been awesome. Uh, great insights. I really loved well, it. I'm telling Link to see how I can watch this when it comes up. <laughs> well, I always, I always listen to myself when I do podcasts just to figure out how many people I owe an apology to. <laughs> no. I, everyone in the chat has been uh, loving it. But thanks for everyone in the chat for ch tuning in. Um, and you can leave comments down below at a later time and I'll try and get to them again. Thanks, Tim. I'll cool. see, see you guys later. It's been great. Good night.